blessed you could join us here on Sunday morning, Battlefield Assembly of God. Richard Orell, you get to be their pastor here. And uh, what a Sunday this is, the Sunday between Christmas and New Year's. And I probably should mention to our regulars that uh, Wednesday night we will have our 7 p.m. Uh, adult Bible study and prayer meeting. Try to keep it to an hour and respect for your time. And um, don't have any special activities planned for uh, New Year's Eve. Um, but I imagine some of you do. Have a wonderful time and remember who you are in Christ and remember Jesus um, is coming soon. Well, <clears throat> I was thinking of a wonderful old song. Uh, when we see Christ, and it's possible, maybe you know it, and sing along with me. Of times the day seems low, our child's heart to bear. We're tempted to complain to mother but Christ will soon appear to catch his bride all tears forever in God's eternal day it
I think if were I to title our remarks today, I would title them something like this, an anatomy of an encounter with Christ. Each one is different, I know you know that. If you have encountered Christ, which probably you have, and thus you would take your Sunday morning to listen and watch. If you have encountered Christ, then you know as well as anyone that everyone's encounter is just a bit different. Well, this one is um, quite a bit different. I want to turn with you into the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. It's chapter 2, verse 25 and following. We'll read down through verse 38. It reads like this. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was eighty-four. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we do thank you for your holy word. We receive it with deepest thanksgiving. May it change our lives draw us close to you, and may each of us, O oh Lord our God, have a fresh encounter with the risen Christ. We give you praise for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, everybody knew that Messiah was coming, everyone in Israel at least. They knew, and uh, nationally, it was the great anticipation. And so uh, there were lots of uh, children that Somebody thought, well, he would make a good Messiah, and, and names floating around <clears throat> that might suggest that family, that mom, uh, thought it was their child who was going to be Messiah. Everybody knew he was coming, but there's something different about these two. Particularly, I want to focus on Simeon. This was during that pregnant pause just before the birth of Christ. I have observed that there is such a pause before uh, the natural birth, and everybody is all abuzz wondering in our day, we were wondering what it was going to be, was it a little girl or a little boy? And uh, nowadays, all of that is known ahead of time. But there's still that, and we'll use the term again, pregnant pause. There is an excitement, an anticipation that is hard to quantify, but is certainly there. Everyone associated with the birth of that child is aglow, wondering, is this the day? And so it was with the birth of Christ nationally. Uh, everyone was waiting and wondering, but then there was Simeon. I love the description of him that he was righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. There's an activity about this. It's not just 
passively sitting around and rolling one's eyes and wondering, could this be the day? Nothing like that. It's on tiptoe anticipation of an event that is going to change everything and everybody. And, and, and so this man, this man was actively waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was actively in the sense of being righteous and devout, in the sense of doing what he knew would please God and avoiding doing what he knew would displease God and would violate his word and his will and break his heart. And so those things this man chose not to do. What a marvelous statement. He was righteous and devout. And he occupied himself with the things that would keep him prepared for Christ's coming. I see a man who did not allow himself to be drawn off into whatever distractions there may have been in that day, in that culture, in that society. Because God, the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> had confided in him heaven's greatest news ever. It's Messiah's coming. And so, because he knew it, it way down deep, when there's a saying I've heard around here, down in his knower, I, I guess, do you have a knower somewhere deep in your heart just where you're aware of something and, and it's just a subtle fact? Well, that seems to be what was going on with him. The Holy Spirit had spoken into his heart and deep inside him, he was aware that Messiah was coming. And so he lived his life in great anticipation of the moment. He acted like it was about to happen. It wasn't just a fact that he had added to a list of things that he happened to be aware of, but rather he acted like he believed that Messiah was coming. I see him peering into each cradle that came in. I see him looking into each cherubic little face as yet another proud set of parents display their child. I see this man looking and in, in the back of his mind, is it this child? And with anticipation he would look. Mm, uh, no, not this one. Uh, maybe that one. And so he would then angulate over to yet another couple with yet another baby and look and, well, somehow, no. It just didn't feel right. It wasn't the right moment. It wasn't the right baby. It wasn't the right couple. And the Holy Spirit witnessed within him, no, this is not the one. Possibly the one just coming into the temple courts. I see him as someone who never tired of meeting the excited and reverent young parents each pair of them as they came to keep the law and to worship God with their obedience. Simeon knew a secret. Messiah was soon to arrive. It was on a different plane altogether than the national anticipation. Maybe this is the year. Maybe this is the city. Maybe this is the couple. Maybe this is the baby. Nah. And just let it go. But not Simeon. There's an intensity of the excitement because he knew down on the inside by the power of the Holy Spirit. He knew just as surely as Mary knew and just as surely as Joseph knew. Now Simeon is party to the miraculous. Simeon knew a secret. Messiah is coming soon. But there's something different about this day. I believe I see it in the statement that is made in verse 27. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. It's a bit different than other days when he had gone to the temple courts, looking, wondering, examining. No, oh, beautiful baby, but... Uh, and he went on. This day is a bit different. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. Simple obedience had drawn him there all those other days. Ah, but today's different. Today's different. Kind of like the moment that you felt compelled to be in the house of God. 
The moment that you felt compelled to turn to a certain television channel knowing that somebody was going to be preaching the gospel. That very moment when you made the choice to tune your car radio to a Christian radio station and you didn't really even know why. It just felt right. Somehow, that's what went on this particular day with Simeon. An urgency had gripped his trembling old heart. As he became enveloped in a love, deeper than any he had ever known, the throbbing power that Simeon felt that day immersed him in such a peace few back then had ever experienced that level of peace, not in that culture, not in that day, not in that land, not under the Roman fist. He was moved upon by the peace that passeth understanding. Probably did not even grasp it. We have it in writing in the Word of God. The God of peace provides the peace of God. Peace that doesn't make a lick of sense. Peace that supersedes anything that's going on. We have it. We know what it is. We understand its source. Simeon was an early recipient and drawn to that peace. He finally finds himself arriving at the temple courts. No doubt there were others who were at least observant of their Jewish customs, but the one couple was different. Something caused him to zero in on the couple. Something caused him to zero in on that infant, that little child. We know it's the Holy Spirit. God's Word indicates that the Holy Spirit drew him there. We learn, those of us who live for God in these days, we learn by doing. So often, it's when we feel the least spiritual that we experience an encounter with God. And we understand that God is there no matter what we're feeling, his responsibility, his feeling of responsibility draws him to our moment and he's there to help us with whatever it is that's going on. And so it was with Simeon that day. I cannot verify how spiritual he felt. All I can verify is the fact that the Holy Spirit drew him and he obeyed and was there and was on duty looking for Messiah. There's something else about this set of parents as Mary and Joseph came to do what was customary in the law for their son. And when Simeon's roomy old eyes finally focused on that robust eight year, excuse me, eight day old babe of Bethlehem's manger, something clicked. Something like what you experienced when someone told you love's sweetest old story, how God so loved the world that he gave his own the begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But remember what that felt like when it clicked with you and it dawned on you, this is not just another factoid to add to a list of things I know. This is something deadly, super, wonderfully important. I need to hear this. And so you encountered Christ, something like Simeon encountered Christ, a, a little bit different because the blood has been shed now. Whereas then, the blood loomed on the horizon. For us, it's back on yesterday's horizon. We know that the crucifixion has occurred, the resurrection has occurred, the ascension has occurred, and so we have a wonderful relationship with a risen Savior. And when you encountered him, you knew in an instant you had found him for whom your soul had so long craved. There's no craving like the craving that we have for Jesus, just to know him. Often, when we first experience that, we don't really understand what it's about. There's just a restlessness, an intensity of longing, and there's an emptiness in our lives that we don't really know. And sometimes I'm told that 
people get kind of crusty when that's going on, sort of like the concept, it gets darkest before the dawning. I'm, I'm told that so often. And then there's a service. Then there's a song that is sung, a sermon that is preached, a Bible lesson that is taught. And that person recognizes and realizes that the emptiness, the, the, the vacuum within my life can only be filled by Him, by a relationship with God. And so in a moment of, of despair with themselves and joy in finding Him, then they open their hearts and they pray that prayer, Jesus, I believe in you. Come into my life. Be my Savior. I will live for you because you died for me. How wonderful, how marvelous. You know, there is an intensity of longing and waiting that is in fact building right now. There's something going on in the heavenlies. Big stuff is afoot. Our own political climate reflects that something amazing is about to happen. It's Jesus. He's coming soon. Oh, wait a minute. I know you say, I've heard that all my life and, uh, you know, uh, get real. Well, I am real. There's an intensity of anticipation of the coming of Christ that right now is greater than anything I've ever known. I've been living for the Lord now for most of my life. And uh, I can tell you that I've never known the intensity of anticipation of Jesus' return. I've never known a time when the lines were so clear cut between righteousness and unrighteousness. I've never known a time when there was uh, such a cross pull and people that are trying to live for God, they're pulled so hard, so strong toward the things of the world, the flesh and the devil. And then on the other hand, the Holy Spirit pulling each of us into the things of God and into Bible study and prayer and living for Jesus and being kind and being loving and being Christ-like. And, and the cross pull is intense but we're making our choice and we're going to take the high road. We're going to take the, 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 the narrow road that leads to life everlasting. We're going to turn away from the broad road that leads to destruction. There's a scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. I know you know it well. It's that passage where Paul was just simply announcing, I'm getting ready to leave here. Let's, let's read it together. It begins in verse 6, actually. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. One version says, all who love his appearing. Do you love the appearing of Jesus Christ? I hope that you do because it's going to happen. It's one of life's inevitabilities. It's going to happen. Jesus is coming back. I don't know when. It could be tonight, could be tomorrow, could be a month down the road, could be a year. I don't know when he's coming back. I just know that collectively the church is doing the same thing that Simeon did in anticipation and preparation for the advent of Christ. We are doing the same thing in preparation for the second coming of Christ. Phase one is the rapture of the church. A secret catching away. He comes as a thief in the night. And the church is gone. Are you ready? It's coming soon. Did you notice that one of the things that he did is he lived a righteous and devout life? I see that in the church. I heard a man preach a message a while back. He said, the church is getting better and better. Yes, the world is getting worse and worse, and it is. 
the difference between the church of the living God and the world and its ways is getting a chasm between the two. Choose your side well. Serve God. Live for Jesus. Become like Simeon. You can do that in Christ to live righteous and devout before the Lord. Walk with Him because the day is getting short. Jesus is coming soon. Would you bow your head and pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the example that lies before us here in Simeon. Thank you, Lord, that he was able to make his choice to live a righteous life, to do the things that please you. And he was willing to display his devoutness. Help us to be like that, that we would not be worried about the consequences socially, but rather that we would only concern ourselves with pleasing you. We know that Jesus is coming soon and we want so much to be ready. And not only us, but help us to be the kind of people who would share the good news with others that Jesus is Lord and that he is returning shortly. We love you, our Father and our God, and we have made our choice to live for you. Who sent your Son to die for the likes of us. Such love the world has never known. We receive it now. We give you praise for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.